So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Stevens, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our to our short term rentals webinar. This time it's an urban living short term rental Middle East and Africa overview, sponsored by Rove Hotels. So I'm the editor of Short Term Rentals here at International Hospitality Media, and I'm also the host for today's session. And before we begin, let's uh, introduce our session sponsor for today and also our MEA Overview webinar series sponsor this week, Row Hotels. So a big thank you to uh, Rove Hotels for sponsoring today and uh, all of this week, as we'll uh, touch on in a little bit. Um, in terms of webinar guidelines, though, for today, all of the details will be posted in the chat by my colleagues, Joe and Danny. So please do uh, post any questions you have there yourself throughout today's webinar. Our discussion will last around 45 minutes before we move on to some audience questions and a recording will also be sent round to everyone within 48 hours of the session. So to add uh, a little bit of context to today's discussion, we covered Silk House's uh, seed funding round last November. We've got Peter here from uh, Silk House to talk to you very shortly. We've got Win One Perfect Stays expansion plans with, uh, with Malwash, one of our speakers today as well as uh, strengthening short-term rental regulatory frameworks in various Emirates of the UAE, from Abu Dhabi to Ajman and Sharjah. So uh, let's introduce our speaker lineup for today. And we're going to kick off, please, uh, with uh, Oriel from Mr. Alfred. Take it away, Oriel. Hello. Good evening. So basically, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Spanish, living in Dubai for... Uh, 12 years now. Uh, we have started the High Guest, which was a holiday home operators around six years ago. And after four or five years of operations, we realized that the technology around uh, this industry was not really the one we wanted for, for Dubai, for the Middle East, and for our operations. So we decided to create our own, uh, spin it off, and, and we call it Mr. Alfred uh, from the Batman Butler. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we're focusing on on providing support to other operators in the Middle East, especially. Also, we have some clients in Europe and Latin America, but mainly in the Middle East, around property management system and revenue management system. Fantastic. Thank you uh, very much, Aurel. Uh, next up, we have Peter from Silk House. Thank you. Uh, a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, so my name is Peter Mayer. I'm the Vice President of Operations at, at Silk House. Uh, we are a short-term uh, rental operator operating across the UAE. Um, we've been in existence now for around two years. Um, we've just ticked over 300, uh, 300 apartments under management. Uh, and I think like uh, we're aiming to really try and to provide a five-star luxury experience, but with the comforts at, at home. And um, I'm actually calling in from Australia here today. So it's a, it's a very early morning. But uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I mean, a, a big thank you, I should say, really, because it's uh, two o'clock or something your time. I only just figured out this morning that was that was the case. But um, no, we're um, we're very grateful to have you on today. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, next up, uh, Mawash from One Perfect Stay. Hello, people. Good evening from Dubai. Uh, my name is Bawash. I'm the CEO for uh, One Perfect Stay, one of the verticals uh, of One Perfect Group. So we specialize, in fact, we are the pioneers of uh, short-term rental alternate hospitality in UAE, founded in uh, 2014, 2015, formally launched in 2016. So we've been there, we've done all, and uh, we still continue to do so. But then there are other verticals also like uh, real estate, buying and selling, and of course, design. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, let's go. Fantastic, Marwash. And uh, last but my name is Lisa. We've got Turab from Night Frank. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm head of hospitality, tourism, and leisure with Night Frank, covering Middle East and Africa. i um, being around for over 20 years. So engaged with the tourism authority, the policy making. Um, uh, tourism development planning and as well most of the mega and giga project in the region um, almost we are engaged with each and every one one way or another so thank you thank you for having and looking forward for interesting thank discussions thank you uh, thank you to Rab and to all of our panelists today it's going to be a great discussion and uh, great to be focusing on such a, a high growth area um, within the middle east and africa region um, so I want to get straight into uh, the discussion, and um, Peter, I'll, I'll I'll turn to you first because these are really exciting times for for Silk House as well, and there may be people tuning in today who aren't aware of of who Silk House are already, but you've just, as we said, raised I think seven point seven five million dollars um, in seed funding last year. You've got some quite ambitious expansion plans as well, but. You know, in, in terms of the sort of travellers coming over to um, Dubai or, or the Middle East, what are you seeing for the sort of potential of the B2B and B2C segments in the region? Sure. So, so I think like we very much, we started out on our journey in, in Dubai specifically, um, which is primarily or is a significant leisure destination. So I think we've really built the initial business based on this, this tourism segment. Um, but we have noted as well in, in doing so that there is quite a significant seasonality that comes with that, that business, yeah? and particularly during the summer months, which are very hot in, in Dubai, um, you do see a decline. So we have started to identify that there is a significant opportunity in the B2B segment. And I think there is a trend globally um, for alternative accommodation um in this kind of in this in this area and so we're seeing it as a significant growth opportunity for us not only in dubai but but in the region and particularly with the big opportunities that we're seeing um, with the diversification of the economy in places like riyadh and abu dhabi that it's a really growing segment for us and you allude to the the opportunities within the market now what, what um you know within the, the guests that you're seeing with silk house what are you kind of seeing with the split between international and, and domestic travelers coming to coming to the region sure so so i think um from a market perspective it is primarily in internet an international market um i mean the uae in, in itself is, is quite a small small country around i think there's 12 million people that reside in the uae itself so around 70 74 percent or so um, of the guests are international and in terms of our our numbers specifically we're seeing about 15 percent are coming from the UAE um, and the important regions for us are really kind of North America Europe um, and then if we look at the Gulf specifically most of the the travel travelers come from Saudi Excellent. and um, yeah thank you very much for that for that Peter and to Rabbi, I'll, I'll turn the discussion over to you because Knight Frank, very well known independent real estate consultancy in uh, many, many markets uh, around the world as well. I I'm not sure exactly what stats you have out there for the for the MEA region as a whole, but what are you 
seeing in in the markets that you're based in the sort of split between corporate and, and leisure travelers at the moment well each country has a little bit different uh, stats on it but uh, like uae is more 60 percent corporate 40 leisure but that 60 percent corporate also indulge in leisure but if you go as per definition, it's 60-40 is the ratio for UAE. Uh, whereas KSA is more uh, geared on religious tourism, but is dramatically moving towards leisure and business as well. So in the coming years, leisure and uh, uh, business will take over. Um, by 2030, the ratio will go totally opposite. But if you take an overall average of the region, you stand around 60-40, where the business is, uh, corporate sector is, is leading the leisure come right next to it um when, when you talk about religious tourism as well what what do you what do you kind of mean mean by that in in in, in those regions it's saudi basically so it's is the the, uh, the the number of religious tourists is is this is is the numbers are way bigger than uh, anything else in the region and it's a matter of infrastructure. The more they provide the infrastructure, this will keep growing uh, to, to, a, to a new uh, uh, heights. Um, and in the coming years, you see the infrastructure is going to get better. The airline connectivity is going to get way better. And this sector will grow to a, a, a new heights. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tureb. And if we look at how companies are starting to use technology as well to spark innovation i think oriel you're probably the perfect person to, to turn to for this how are you seeing you know with your own role at um mr alfred now how how are companies being maybe forced to embrace new new technologies um in, in the market yeah i think uh in our industry uh, which is highly operational i think we have two aspects in technology no? you have the technology the technology that allows you to differentiate from the competition in terms of USP. And we can talk about guest experience, communication with guests, even some technology in marketing. And I think this is starting to happen now because Dubai is not such a mature market as the US or Europe in, in terms of holiday home and location rentals. And then the, there is the other, uh, the other part, which is improved productivity. So uh, efficiency of the operations, which in the end revolves also to the uh, service and everything. But I, I think you can divide these two. In, in, in terms of both aspects, again, Dubai, I think, is catching up. I think COVID has been a wake-up call for everyone. I mean, I am busy with how they started after COVID, but uh, the companies that have been in Dubai long enough that see this transition, we can we can see a huge difference in, in, uh, in the change. And, and as Mr. Alfred, we have more than 50 clients in Dubai helping them with the technology, um, we see you know, that this, this uh, appetite for, for improving efficiency and also improving the USP towards guests. And, and I think we're in a very good position now in Dubai. And, and it's interesting because um, you, uh, well, you founded Mr. Alfred back in 2022. So mm -hmm. as you say, coming out of pandemic and you're a SaaS company, you're working, I think, with around 45 property managers now, mm -hmm. um, if, if they start, they start to correct. But you originally started out as an operator with Higer. So how has it kind of spun out of of, of that as well? And I think you're still going with, with high guests as well. But yeah. how has this kind of come about, this move? Yeah, so we were working as high guests. We, we reached more than 200 properties in Dubai very fast. I mean, with the wave of the beginning of Dubai. And, and, and we realized that five years ago, six years ago, the PMSs, the property management systems out there were not uh, that advanced as they are today, probably, and specifically not for our, our market, you know, because we have any, any market has regulations and things like this, but we didn't see it in Dubai. You know? So we created our own for us. And then during COVID, we, we shifted our, we pivoted our resources towards uh, tech development. Uh, we make it, what we have internally, we made it commercial. And then we offered it to two, three companies that we that we had very close connection with. They loved it. And after testing the MVP, we decided to commercialize it less than one year ago uh, in terms of like open uh, commercialization. And, and our growth is, is, is massive. It's very good in Dubai. So 
And then we also realized that the company in Dubai, you know, we may touch these points later more in detail, but the, the competition is, is, is very high. The barriers of entry are low. So we are seeing more and more and more small companies uh, being created, but with, um, with lack sometimes of, of hospitality or even revenue management it's not know-how. So we decided to also provide tools of revenue management with our expertise of more than seven years in the market and, and the access to data and, and, and the access to understanding the market and not the guest. And we provide tools as well as some uh, services in, in when it comes to revenue management. Fantastic. Um, and, and you're right, we will come back to that that increased competition a bit later. So I'd be very interested to get your, your insights into that. Mm -hmm. um, Tura, but I'll, I'll head back to you as well, because from, from, from your perspective as well, how are you sort of in the, in the whole MEA region that you're covering? How are you seeing companies, operators or, or other startups embracing technology and being able to cater to whether it's corporate or, or leisure travelers? I think it's uh, uh, the, uh, in the region, most of the developers are younger, newer. So people have the opportunity to introduce technology from start. Um, so technology will play a, a bigger role. This sector is already growing and to take it to next level, technology will take it to next level. So the quicker we adapt to technology, the quicker this growth will multiply. Um, is it a, a smart locks? Is it a keyless do doors, online payments? Is it dynamic pricing with just uh, 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 Ryle mentioned? Is it a yield management? Is it easy access, online access? Is it a guest and uh, you know, communication in terms of the client relation, uh, the, the, uh, the customer relation? Uh, is it an AI? Is it VR? Uh, the quicker you get into it, um, a region has one of the highest uh, penetration rate in terms of uh, technology. Um, if you look at Saudi, um, they have a special ministry where everything is gone uh, online. Everything is, every ministry, every, uh, if you go to Ministry of Tourism, you need anything, you click the button and you get it. Uh, you need visa, you click the button, you get it. So people are getting used to, to have all the apps and everything to get it done online. And also it's cheaper and efficient for the operation. Um, it will reduce your cost if, uh, and it will also help the client not to go through the hassle of, let's say, the, the uh, keyless door. If you have an app, you just go open it, you're done with it. You don't need to go somewhere, pick up the key and you know, go. Same with the payment, same with the booking. So I think techno uh, this sector has a huge potential, huge, huge potential. Uh, and technology will expedite that uh, that journey, um, and it will it will be beneficial for uh, customers and as well as to, for the operator too. I'm interested. Do you do you sort of see the the Middle East sort of catching up with other markets in in the world, or do you think the Middle East Africa region is is ready to lead the way in in technology and innovation in the future? I think we have to separate uh, two uh, countries, the UAE and Saudi, they are uh, in a different mode um, comparing to the rest of the region. So they are all gone for latest and the greatest and the uh, you know newer technologies. Um, and Saudi is too young for this. But as I was telling Peter, that it's going to grow like there's no tomorrow. There's a huge potential. Uh, uh, it's, it's very much predicted that the UA, uh, Saudis are going to win 2030 Expo. Um, behind the scene, we are very much aware of it. The minute, and it's going to be announced in the coming days, the minute it's announced, the whole the business level is, will go to, to, to new heights. And there's a huge shortage of room to fulfill 2030 requirement. Huge, huge shortage. We're talking about, uh, we are not even 20% uh, of what we need to, uh, to have... Uh, uh, to host Expo 2030. So all of a sudden, uh, there will be a rush. And this sector can play a good role. Now, uh, this is a way to expand it quicker and faster. And then Saudi and UAE, in terms of technology, they will be leading it. Is, is there are new products coming in. All the uh, new developers, they're using the latest and the, the new technology, which is easy to integrate rather than if you are uh, existing uh, destination very much settled everything is uh, you know old you can't change many things yes here you're developing from scratch 
So you can straight away go to the new technology. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Tirab. And uh, Mawash, I'll, I'll come to you uh, at last as well. And talking, talking growth there, how are you seeing as an operator your, your ADRs or, or your occupancy rates now start to... Are they, are they recovering now post-pandemic? Sure. So um, when I look at my current year and then specifically current month, uh, we have just closed October on 95% occupancy. Um, and then again, you know, a large part of business is seasonal and this is just the beginning of the season. So October comes and your occupancy and the ADRs, it's a completely different picture as compared to the summers. Um, if you want to compare it to uh, post-pandemic, I think the world altogether has completely shifted to a new reality post-pandemic. I would not say these are the aftercurrents of uh, of the uh, of the post-COVID. Rather, it's a new reality that we are living in post-COVID, which is frequent travelers, and I think you know the um the the audience has also you know shifted a lot like you know with millennials and gen z's it's more about you know traveling and exploring rather than you know saving and building for the future which they cannot see so i don't know how to relate it to post covid as such but it's just a completely new shift and these are the dynamics of the new shift which definitely translate into better ADRs, uh, better occupancy. But at the same time, we also have to take into account that this, this, this region is seasonal, right? Summers is seasonal where different strategies work, but for uh, your high season, the peak season, where the temperatures go low, you have people flocking from all parts of the world. And you talk there of this new exciting reality not um for for the whole MEA, mea market there but um and as we move away from the pandemic and i don't want to dwell on it too much but are you seeing that that pent-up demand and, and maybe some other more societal or economic um trends also impact those rates or those occupancy that you, you talk about Yes, definitely. Um, again, you know, um, looking at the business and the unit mix, I think it also depends a lot on the sort of uh, asset mix you have. So, you know, more primary units you will have, that means uh, more outside travelers and tourists you will be catering to. But if you are on the outer periphery of the city, it will be more long-termish uh, bookings, which would rather you know extend for several weeks or months. So, um, so, so depending on the asset mix that you you have, and then you know the the tourists that you're catering to, even to the platforms that you're 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 mar marketing these properties at. So everything contributes. Uh, you know, different dynamics, socio-political. I mean, we we all know that, right? Um, and, and Dubai is such a place where you will have an equal amount of tourists from uh, Russia and then, uh, you know, um, India and, of course, Europe and America. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marwash. Um, I'll, I'll go back to, to Oriol as well, because I think a couple of our panelists have already mentioned the, the, the Expo. Um, I mean, the, the Middle East had its first ever World Cup last year in Qatar. Um, I mean, I'm a big sports fan as well, so I'm keeping right up to date with everything there. But um, I, I think Sa Saudi, for example, is bidding for the Asian Winter Games in 2029. Even just today, we're hearing uh, 2034 FIFA World Cup probably going to be held in Saudi Arabia. I wouldn't be surprised if the Olympics is there too. So, you know, when we talk about these events, sporting or cultural like the Expo, how do you think that is having an impact on occupancy rates or, or ADRs that you're seeing? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I think that, I mean, going more to the detail, uh, I think, or, or, well, first starting general, I think the Middle East, but I think it's Dubai and Saudi, though, what we're talking about, I think yeah. Rap said it. No? Uh, the world is, or, or we are starting to lead a lot of things in the world. No? So 
started with the Expo, World Cup, and all this, but also the economic environment, the, the ease of doing business of Dubai, the huge investment in Saudi. So I think that there is a mid to, mid to long term game in this region where we believe that this region will come out as, as quite a winner in the worldwide um, table. No? So apart from that, going to the Expo, I, I believe the Expo was amazing. I mean, in all my seven years of, of, of experience, it was the best month. In, in, in seven years, no? uh, the, the month, the last month of Expo. Also was a bit of COVID still there, so it was a bit mixed, but the Expo definitely gave us a, like a huge push into the into the industry. The World Cup a bit less because it was in Qatar, so there was a bit of an impact, but not as much as, as Expo. But what is certain is that these events really make a different a difference in the in the industry. And if there is one such so, so big as a World Cup every year, it's totally amazing. No? So I think that's very, very positive. Also as a marketing for as a destination. Yeah, and um, uh, and on, on ADRs as well, are, are you noticing that, uh, I mean, of course, we, we're talking here predominantly about Dubai for, for your market here, but how, has, the, uh, has the World Cup, has the Expo had a significant impact in, in Dubai as you're seeing with, with other countries too? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. In Dubai Expo was amazing. The World Cup originally was amazing, and I think uh, adding a little bit of Maushi, if you if you if you don't mind, I, I think also Dubai is a is a city or destination that I don't think there is a big problem in demand. I think demand is very high, but as she said, it's a matter of price point. No? So mm-hmm. getting higher occupancies uh, is okay. Is not easy, but it's quite especially in high season. Even in low season, we are seeing occupancies very high. It's a matter of how you price yourself because we don't have a problem in in, in, the, in demand. We have been growing in terms of visitors, tens, twenty percent in the last uh, post pandemic. So so and, and and Chinese travelers have already not come to Dubai as they were coming before uh, COVID. So so I think Dubai is, is a very good place in terms of demand. Then supply plays a huge role in when it comes to uh, oversupply, in my opinion. Therefore, it's a matter of setting the price correctly to optimize your, your profit, but demand is strong. So that gives me very a lot of optimism in the future because a market with good demand, it will always uh, be positive. So, so we're quite optimistic in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Aurel. P- Peter, are you observing something similar with, with Silk House, particularly over the last sort of 10 or 11 months since, uh, since the World Cup, for example? Yeah, for sure. So as it, as it was mentioned, I think that we are a very seasonal market. So we we tend to look at how we're progressing, um, looking at the same month a year, a year ago. Um, and we have performed, like I think occupancy has been quite similar, but we are seeing a little bit of a depression when it comes to ADR. Yeah. And I think that there's a number of reasons for that. There is some that are specific to our business and that's probably on the basis of how our Asset mix has changed somewhat as we're opening up some sort of tier two neighborhoods, things of that nature. But I think like at a macro scale, um, yeah, as, as it was mentioned, the demand still still definitely exists, but there has been a lack of those really global events this year. And then secondly, the supply is, is really growing at quite a quite a rapid rate. So demand is, is definitely um, continuing to increase, but I mean, if you look at Airbnb listings, I think they grew 34% year on year um, this year itself. So, yeah, there's always going to be that balance. Um, but I, I, we have seen a slight depression in ADRs uh, compared to last year. Thank you, um, Peter. And I, I'm sure we can touch a little bit more about the, the challenges and the opportunities coming um, into the Middle East um, Africa region shortly. So thank you for that. Um, Turab, I think if we sort of develop into the the investment landscape as well. How would you assess the current landscape um, in, in the region and where are the major developments or projects being funded in your opinion? I think globally is, is uh, in terms of investment, this is the happening place uh, in, in the, the region we have around, uh, uh, is touching now 2.1 trillion worth of investments. Uh, construction work is going on. Uh, with uh, 1.1 is in uh, KSA and the remaining is spread uh, around the uh, uh, rest of the region. Uh, there are around 515,000 keys are under development in terms of hospitality. 
so the, the growth is phenomenal, uh, despite the fact there's a Ukrainian war, despite the fact some other disruptions, but the region is, is just blowing to a new heights. And uh, uh, this, I call it, a, it's going to be coming five years or 10 years, you can call it. Um, if nothing unexpected happen, uh, this will be the golden era where you have new airlines uh, coming in. The region will end up having three to four global best airline out of 10 uh, will be out of Middle East. Uh, you, you, by 2030, you will end up having a million keys in the region. Million means you will be a powerhouse. Uh, so uh, to me, it looks optimistic. Year on year growth in terms of this sector is 11%, which is phenomenal. Um, I just see positivity overall. Uh, uh, investment. Uh, the, I think the biggest uh, uh, boost to investment came for two reasons. One is uh, uh, Expo, the way Dubai handled the Expo in the middle of uh, COVID, uh, where the world was shut down, even the most advanced uh, uh, cities in the world from Singapore, Hong Kong to London to New York, everything was shut down. And there was one tiny city was not even visible on map, Dubai, it was 24 seven open, no, nothing got stopped. Airport never stopped. Um, that was, that gave a confidence to the world that Dubai means business. After nine, uh, this uh, pandemic, see how much uh, business has moved from rest of the world, UK, Europe, is it, uh, you know, to, 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 to Dubai. Uh, real estate gone to sky because the businesses are moving. We don't have a great offices. We don't have the, the quality, uh, especially the, uh, the luxury accommodation is gone. Whatever you are putting it together next day is, is sold out. So this is the benefit they're reaping for the difficult time they, they face very bravely. When people were shutting down the cities, they kept it open and kept it running. And now they're benefiting out of it. Dubai, I was just presenting the numbers in the hospitality investment conference. Uh, Dubai is, is the first country, region, Saudi and Dubai together are the first countries in the world uh, across the pre-pandemic numbers. rest of the world is still struggling. They haven't reached even closer to, to those numbers okay. of 2019. UAE and Saudi are the two countries which have crossed that. And that was crossed in September. Today we are in, uh, entering November. So it means we are going to go exceed way, way beyond uh, 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 pre-pandemic numbers. So overall investment scenario looks presently uh, two trillion. <laughs> it itself speaks uh, how the investment scenario looks like. Wow! Um, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, to have some very useful um, information that I hadn't been aware of. Um, Malwash, as as an operator as well yourself, are, are you similarly optimistic for the for the growth and the investment coming into the region? Uh, definitely. I mean, optimism is there, you know, it's part of, it's part of life. You cannot really operate without it. But if you, again, you know, look at your outer dynamics, uh, socioeconomic, political, um, then of course it's, it's writing on the wall, no matter how miserable it is. And, you know, we are definitely like, we do feel that, you know, where the world is going is not a very good place with wars happening. But again, you know, there are ultimate beneficiaries. And uh, fortunately, um, this region definitely is benefiting um, from, from the unrest uh, in the rest of the world. That's how the reality is spanning out. And, you know, being here, uh, having the first movers advantage, uh, we are getting the effects of it, let's say, in a, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm I'm definitely uh, optimistic. I'm positive, and you know the way Saudi is also growing. Uh, that's also going to be co-benefiting the the other regions, like you know uh, how it's with the with with the European countries under under Schengen. So it's I I think it's it's panning out the same way for all the Middle Eastern slash GCC countries. Where you know there, there are also talks of uh, having one visa, and definitely so there's going to be more movement, uh, whether it's in real estate or investments, and ultimately, you see short-term rental, alternate hospitality. When we come to the management, you 
you're 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 part of the much later cycle of the the entire uh, entire picture, right? It starts from investment. It starts from real estate. And then, you know, there's there's probably there's off plan or there's a ready to move in property. And then again, you know, when eventually you come on to the management part, you got to decide whether it's to do with annual or short term read Airbnb. So, so yeah, definitely. I mean, um, things look good. Yeah. And I think, um, I think we may have done a story maybe two years ago, but you were also looking to potentially move um, into the UK or Europe and, and Turkey. Is that something that you're still looking to progress with or, or sort of use this investment and interest to expand into new markets? Sure. So uh, we we have a strategic alliance with the company in Europe, which are managing something uh, like 200 units. So uh, it's definitely there and it's happening. And it's already happened in uh, Italy, uh, Greece. Um, so uh, and it's happening through the strategic alliance where we are co-marketing each other's properties and, you know, giving a boost. They are doing the same with the, our units in UAE and we are doing that with their units in in Europe and definitely I'm I'm open to uh, more such opportunities uh, more the Mario yes excellent and uh, well we look forward to, to hearing more about those uh, expansion plans over the next yeah. few years um Peter as well um how how are you seeing the the investment landscape skiff um shift because you have raised some some fairly significant funding by terms of, of seed funding last year and where do you maybe also see the opportunity for more capital spend over the next couple of months or years yeah so so i <clears throat> i think that uh like obviously in the startup ecosystem um we've kind of just been through a bit of a funding winter um and globally with kind of how the economic situation has has kind of progressed We've seen it become very difficult to raise money. I think it, it definitely depends on the type of business as well. Um, Short-term rentals as a kind of, I suppose, uh, a business class are fortunate in that they are um, generally have, have pretty positive cash flow, um, are relatively profitable from day one. Um, so compared to other businesses which have very low margins, um, require a sin significant scale to reach profitability. They are more interesting, I would I would say, or become much more interesting to investors of, as of late. I think regionally, um, we're fortunate in in that uh, this the situation has been a little bit more robust here compared to to the global kind of economy, and as a result, whereas previously it, it's kind of investment has been flowing out of the region. I think what's what's really changed is investment is now flowing into the region and and particularly into the startup ecosystem, um, and so that is I think a really encouraging sign, and we're seeing that there is like a well developed kind of seed stage or, or early stage startup ecosystem at place here, which has been developed by regional funds, but now that these global funds are starting to come in, there's a level of sophistication, and I think that there's a big gap a gap for growth capital to come in and, and really kind of raise or fund the next or the, the big global companies that will kind of come out of the region. And I think that's what's really exciting um, and we'll see coming coming in the next sort of five to 10 years from, from this region. Excellent. Um, thank, thank you, Peter. And I think it's great that we've covered um, investment and you touched there on, on sophistication. But Oreo, I think it's also important to note that there's more stringent reg regulatory frameworks coming in and something that you're seeing in Dubai as well. So how would you maybe assess where Dubai and the Middle East is at the moment compared to some other markets, maybe even Spain or, or other markets you know and, and, and where where they are compared to those markets? Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, today in Dubai, in terms of quality homes, like almost every residential unit in Dubai can have a license with some exceptions, but let's say 80, 85% of the residential units can have a, a business, uh, yeah, sorry, a holiday homes license at $100 a year. So it's fairly uh, easy to to get regulated, right? As opposed to Spain, we operated in Spain and 
in Barcelona is very local, no? So in Barcelona, you couldn't have any any new life. No? So that's huge difference. What's the impact in the business? No? In Barcelona, you have a license and your profit is three times long-term rentals in terms of short-term rentals. In Dubai, the market is so so um, liberal, let's sort of say, that it balances so much that the, the difference between short-term and long-term is like 10, 15, 20%, uh, especially this, this day. No? So, so that's the main difference. Uh, the, the, the other thing is that as, as I think Peter mentioned, no, the, the amount of units that are growing, but not only the units. The other day we were with uh, the regulatory body here, the Dubai Econ Economy and Tourism Department, and they were saying that number of operators have grown for, for, from 400 to 600 in one year. No? So that really, um, it's huge. I mean, compared to any European city uh, that I, we know more. So so that's where the, the, the pressure of supply comes from. and. So far, we don't see any regulatory change. Actually, the, the government is pushing for more growth, and I think it's happening the same in Abu Dhabi. It, it's happening in Saudi. So I, uh, it's going to happen in Ras al-Khaimah, that it's, quite, uh, it's going to be strong in the, near, in the next year. So I think in terms of regulations, the barriers are very low. But of course, when <laughs> there is very easy access to the market, it has impacts in other metrics of the business. That's, that's, that's really interesting, actually, um, Polyon. Uh, and to to wrap um, from from your from your own angle, what do you what do you think is maybe still needed to wrap in terms of regulatory frameworks and maybe how long is it going to take to actually roll out what you, what you're seeing in in other markets and how sophisticated they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, the good thing of Dubai is that they they are like a startup as well. No, they 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 have an MVP, they launch it, and then they test it, and they they adapt it, and they improve the regulations. That's happening. That happened in Dubai with the with the short term rental, and it's happening in other cities. In Dubai, based on the conversation we had with the, the, the tourism department, I think they are trying to 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 add some control measures uh, because I think the increase of operators, people with not that much experience in this industry. They saw that was impacting a little bit in the reviews. So I think they are working very, very hard to, to improve that. And they are putting in place some measurements. And they are also kind of uh, forcing or empower or help or pushing companies to embrace more technology in terms of smart locks, in terms of control of access and all this, which is going to be, uh, in my opinion, very, very positive uh, because the leaders on the markets, we, we, we like to everyone to do best practices. No? So uh, again, there is a lot of, of uh, iteration in terms of improving regulations and and that's what's happening in this, in Dubai especially. And then the other Emirates are kind of following a little bit the, the Dubai experience. Thank you, Oriol. And and to wrap, is that something you would you would concur with from, from your role at night, Frank? So I'm basically advisor to most of these tourism authorities. So these regulations are um, I have done regulation by myself for these. Um, it is comparing to other sector. Is it a real estate? Is it hospitality? Is it a F and B? Is it the desert tourism? Is it the regulations are world class? Um, and as uh, Ariel said, we is, we it's new destinations, so we just see what world is doing and we get the best out of it. But in this particular case, they are behind. They're still very young and it's evolving so fast. The regulation couldn't um, cope up with it, and not much. Uh, still, there's a lot to do. Uh, Saudi is is way uh, is in the process. They just launched hospitality and uh, uh, some F and B and tourism regulations in this area. They are they are a bit uh, bit far. So there's uh, still quite a lot to 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 cover. But as the in UAE industry is growing at a, a fast pace, and uh, they are, uh, uh, they, I think by next year you see some new regulation coming out to simplify the process and regulate it, add some tiers in it. Um, so still a lot to be done. Uh, this comparing to what they have done for other sectors, uh, there, there's a gap which will you will see it's filled up in the coming years. Peter, would you say something similar there? Do you see, as more markets start to open up for, for regulation, do you see that being conducive to further growth in the market? Yeah, look, I, I think that in the region, Dubai is, is definitely the most mature when it comes to the regulation that it has in place. Um, but it is it is also much, much older as well. Like markets like Abu Dhabi and and, and Riyadh 
are really just opening. And I think potentially they are kind of testing the water before really opening it up to the market. But I, the, the main constrictor that I've seen to, to growth is the number of permits that you can obtain per, per landowner. Yeah, so when Abu Dhabi opened up their regulation, you could only have one permit per landowner. So you could potentially own a whole tower, but only get a license for one one apartment. Yeah. That has since changed, and similar similar regulation is also in place in in Saudi Arabia, which we do see as constrictive to to growth. But I but I do expect that to to kind of change, and I do see that like Dubai is a good model, which which these uh, these entities should be learning from and and applying. Excellent. Um, I want to, we've got a couple of uh, audience questions coming through as, as well. So I want to, I'll probably merge some of those into the, the questions coming up. But I want to get everyone's thoughts before in the, in the last few minutes before we, we close off. Um, Mawash, we've, we've, we've talked to, uh, quite a lot about some of the, the opportunities within the region as well. Um, but what do you see as some of the main opportunities and also challenges to to the growth of the of the region and, and the MEA market overall. I think we've spoken so much about the opportunities. So let's focus on the challenges. So we address them and we move forward. Mm. Um, I would specifically speak about Dubai. Uh, you see, in the past, not just in the past, but you know, in the post pandemic, there has been such a hike um, in 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 the prices for the real estate, the capital growth. And that has also sort of, you know, translated into much better rental yields. And that I'm talking about annual rentals. So, you know, having said that, that just makes short-term rental a lot more challenging, right? For example, uh, a, a supreme one bedroom at, let's say Dubai Harbor, which is facing water just at the back of farm, uh, if let's say that's going for three million and it's fetching two hundred thousand in uh, in annual rent, how much more can you possibly do with with short term? So you know then then it you have to match the 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 owner's expectation and that's where the challenge is. So. Um, this is this is one thing uh, which is a challenge uh, because your annual rentals keep catching up to no matter how much the uh, the the short term rentals make annual rentals are still um, moving north so that's something that you know we we really need to look at because at the end of the day there's going to be a threshold there's going to be a, a limit to that and then you know unless and until the homeowner has some other motivation uh, it's it's difficult to 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 convince them to get their units managed on on short term rental i th i think um, um another sorry go on no 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 please please <laughs> yeah i think i didn't realize you were on the call <laughs> and uh, what i've seen in my experience right when i started some 8 years ago we really started from a handful of units uh no investment fund whatsoever and then, you know, now reaching almost 200. Uh, last year, we were 200, got down to, you know, half of that and then rose up again. So, you know, seeing the story of scale, um, I think Europe is different, right? There are more uh, mom and pop shops. I think average company operates at about 25 to 30 units and still uh, they, make a, they make a decent return on that. So even with, with 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 the scale that I'm operating on, or let's say, you know, top five, top 10, that's the sort of number you're talking about, let's say 100 plus. And that's, you know, when you, when you gain scale. And when you're in that space, it is another challenge to really maintain the standard. There was a time where I called myself, you know, bespoke, boutique, uh, a holiday home company, but you know, having that sort of a scale where, and it's unclustered, right? It's not at one place where you have two hundred units, and you know, it's up and down, and everybody can be catered at 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 one given area. This is all scattered, unclustered across the UAE. So I think meeting expectations, uh, especially on the guest side, uh, with no matter how big your team is and how immaculate your communication is 
the biggest challenge of scale is maintaining the quality. I, I think um yeah that that's all that's all really um really interesting and relevant to the discussion. I think it would also perhaps be slightly remiss of me. We've got a, a question um from the audience and um it's I, I think it's quite quite relevant to address this and, and we're saying that with, with the war happening within the region, although it's separate to um uh du Dubai and, and some areas of the Middle East, but do you expect this to have a detrimental effect or impact on on hospitality and travel to to markets like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Saudi? If it's not, and that's a question from the audience. Sorry, what would have the impact on these markets? Yes, so with with the war happening within the region, do you think that will have a detri um, detrimental effect on? regions like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Saudi, if that is a prolonged conflict. Yeah, like I mentioned in our conversation earlier, that, you know, the there definitely is an effect, uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, it's positive. And again, you know, this being a safe haven, everything completely regulated, Dubai is this, one of the most safest uh, cities in the world. So, of course, you know, when there is unrest anywhere else, um, and any kind of right, political or um, you know, uh, economic, all all kinds of. And then you know your regulations are in place, but again, the point of entry is sweet. So I don't know if detrimental, but uh, on the positive note, that's that's something which keeps uh, Dubai growing. You have uh, the whole world. Um, coming to Dubai and making it home. Absolutely. And, and um, thank, thank you very much for, for that, Mawash. I think, Turab, you, you might have had a similar point as well on, 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 the, on the war and, and hopefully, of course, we hope for a, a peaceful um, resolution before too long. And, you know, what are that and are there, are there any other factors as well which you think would challenge the, the growth of the region? 200% uh, is a global city, is globally connected, uh, is to take Amherst Airline, is connected to 160 uh, destinations globally. Um, Marwa uh, is right, uh, Mahabush is right that yes, is uh, Dubai is, 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 is less affected, but eventually with the recession going on in some part of the world, with the war going on, uh, now, now I think onward uh, you can see the impact will creeping up. Um, as is next door uh, conflict, it it will have more impact. Already there is a travel warning gone to 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 many countries uh, to avoid traveling to this part of the world. Um, so with the travel warnings, in, uh, immediately there will be an impact, uh, and the recession going high in certain areas. Uh, Europe is catching up fast with the recession. It's going to have an impact. Uh, slow, Dubai doesn't get uh, directly hit immediately. Uh, Saudi will not be hit directly uh, because they don't they have their own dynamics, but it will have an impact eventually. We are part, it's a global city, very well connected. Uh, where are we getting our most of the travelers out of UK? If the recession keeps going, creeping up, which is, it is, it is going to have an impact. So our feeder market will have an impact. If they have an impact, we will have a uh, we have quite good shocks, so we absorb, uh, you know, uh, certain shocks. Um, uh, but this will immediate, uh, immediately you will start seeing some impact in the coming days on occupancies on, on utilization of these uh, facilities. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. So a very uh, articulately um, put across. Um, Peter, as as well, I'll probably address a similar um, question to you, really, and. Yeah, what, what do you see maybe as the, the key challenges or, or opportunities now for, for growth within the region? Um, yeah, from your, from your perspective. Um, yeah, I, th I think that uh, the Mawash actually um, mentioned a number of the, the key challenges that we're facing as an operator. Um, so they are quite similar in terms of like maintaining our quality at scale. Um, and then also definitely the the long-term market in in Dubai is 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 a challenging one. Yeah. 
So the ability to really show that uh, that margin profile between short term and long term. And I think that that's like what has kind of been mentioned, but there is a lot of interest to move to the region because it is um, somewhat isolated or insulated from the, the global economy. And then at the same time, you have purchasing power kind of decreasing on a, at a global level. So the the kind of increase that we can uh, kind of get in a, in a short term basis is not proportional in, as to what we're seeing on the long term long term basis. So that is clearly an, a one challenge. I think for us as well is if we want to really scale, you know, into thousands of, of units, finding access to to kind of like that that quality supply at scale is a, is a real challenge for us. Um, right now, and and Dubai is very much long tail led. So it's individual kind of uh, investors that are putting their, their properties on a short-term basis. And we've built our, our supply on that basis. But uh, as we move into markets like Abu Dhabi and, and Saudi, where you see a lot more institutional kind of ownership of supply, our model for supply will change quite drastically. And, and finding the right partner to enable that is, is going to be a really important step for us. Thank you, um, Peter. And Oriel, same question to you. How, what would you, uh, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, my my colleagues have mentioned everything. In the end, we we, I think Peter added the 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 acquiring of um, property owners, which which I think it's it's important the the fragmentation that there is in Dubai in terms of acquisition. Um, also, for example, I have the experience of Barcelona. No, you, you, you manage, you convince an owner of a building in Barcelona, and I think he manages ten units, right? You, you have a building in Dubai with two hundred fifty units, right? So, so the, the 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 design of the city makes it very difficult also to have clusters in in which improve operations, for example, and logistics. Or comparing to Europe, you have the, the very good public transportation in Dubai. Transport logistics in terms of Traffic is very complicated, you know? so and and the city is built across maybe a, a road of forty kilometers, or so. So the the specifics of uh, but but yeah, these are the challenges of, of an operator you know, of a specific. So yeah, I think mentioning everything with these specifics of the city. Thank you, uh, thank you, Aura. Well, that hour has absolutely sped by, um, and uh, I know that there are several more questions. Um, we could have, uh. We could have been able to address if we had a little bit more time so very grateful for all of your time and um, we have got um, a couple of uh, questions Question. as well and what i would say as well is we've got all of our speakers contact details in the chat including mine as well so if you want to follow up with those questions then we'll make sure that uh, those get uh, addressed by our speakers on our phone very shortly so big thank you to uh, oriel to peter to mawash and to turab now, this is actually the second in our four-part MEA webinar series this week. So make sure you tune into our service department MEA spotlight session, which is tomorrow at the slightly earlier time of 2 p.m. GMT, and then our urban living alternative real estate session on Thursday, both no cost and both hosted by my colleague, George Sell, and links to sign up for both are in the chat now. Then we're back in our usual 4 p.m. Uh, slot next Tuesday, the 7th of November for our Rising Stars round table. Again, the sign up link is in the chat now. Uh, another exciting occasion taking place in Belfast in Northern Ireland on the 22nd and 23rd of January 2024 is our annual recharge event, which spans the intersections of travel, hospitality and real estate. So you can book your tickets now and we're looking forward to seeing some of you out there in January. For opportunities to work with us, please do contact my colleagues, Jordan and Piers, whose details are on the screen now. We're going to keep this session open for just another two minutes if you want to jot down any details from the chat, and there was plenty um, discussed there as well, so we can follow up with those questions uh, post-webinar. Big thank you to our sponsor, Rove Hotels, uh, thank you again to all of our excellent speakers for a cracking discussion today. Uh, and most of all, thank you all for tuning in today and listening. We'll see you all again very soon. Thank you very much, everyone.